I'm glad many of you have given Easter a second shot. And I just trust and pray that God has already, has already been using this service to do the one thing that's so important, draw you closer to him. Happy Easter. Can you, can you imagine a world, envision a world without terror, without suffering, without sickness, without disease, without crime? Well, Easter points to that world already in the making. It's already in the works. You see, Easter is what defines who we are as Christ's followers. It's the one event that in this crazy, confusing, broken world of ours that gives us hope and gives us direction, that there is purpose in life and there is meaning in life. That's what Easter and the message of Easter points to. A story in the news a couple of years ago came out of St. Petersburg, Florida, true story, about a 46-year-old police officer who was mortally wounded by a teenager in a call that he was responding to, a suspicious person report. The officer's death, of course, was devastating to the community of St. Petersburg. Why? Because that was the third officer within that same month who had fallen in the line of duty. And what made it so devastating was three in one month, the previous 30 years, they had never had a police officer die in the line of duty. As this officer was taken to the hospital, his fellow police officers followed the vehicle and when he was pronounced dead and they were transporting his body out of the hospital. Many of his fellow officers stood and they saluted his body as it was being transported. There was a reporter that happened to be there on the spot, and she spoke to one of the officers, and she said, do you have any comments? And here's what the officer said, we live in a fallen world. And then he quietly walked away. What that officer described is the foundational belief of Christianity, that our world is broken, that initially God created this world and He created it good. And he created it for good. And he created this world beautiful. And I know there's a lot of beauty still in our world. But this world was created for good and for God's glory. And then our first parents, Adam and Eve, they messed everything up. They sinned. They fell from grace. They deviated from God's plan and God's purpose. And hence introduced brokenness into our world. Easter is about God fixing the brokenness through His Son, Jesus Christ. And see, all of us here today, our lives are really a mixture of what? Both beauty and brokenness, the good and the bad, the ups and the downs. And hopefully today in your life, there's more beauty than brokenness, there are more ups than downs, and there's more good than bad. But that's the world that we live in. Allow me to illustrate this. Let's say that all of you were given a piece of paper when you came into church today. And I ask you to pull out that piece of paper, and I want you to draw a vertical line down the center of that piece of paper. And I want you to put two headings. In one column, I want you to put the heading good. In the next column, I want you to put the heading bad. And let's say we were going to divide up all the good and all the bad that's in our lives today. And so let's fill out the good side first. And let's say that I asked you to fill out the good side. What would be some of the good things that you would be thankful for in your life today? As I thought about this, I thought, wow, if you, ha- if you ask that question, you've got to be careful who you ask it to. If you ask that question to 20-something-year-olds who don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, they'd be like, good, wow, uh, free Wi-Fi, man, and uh, Halo 5, and my state legalizing pot, man, and iPhone 6, can't wait for that to come out, okay? That's not what we're talking about. When we talk about good, what would be some of the things that you would acknowledge as that's good in your life? If you're married here today you would definitely say, my marriage, that's good, right? If you had children, you would put your children down there. That's one of the good things that God's blessed my life with. I've got children. The third thing that I I think that all of you should put down there is Carl Toady is my pastor. That would be a good thing. Uh. (laughs) Some of the good that we would put in that list, fun places that we have been able to visit, hobbies that you enjoy, you have good health, you'd say, thank you, God, for my good health, and that's one of the good things in my life, and you'd put that down. Your career, your job, 
We could all be thankful living in America for clean water. So many people don't have access to clean water in our work. Can you imagine that? We would be thankful for clean water or a roof over our head or, or food in, in our refrigerator. Things that many times we might take for granted, but these are blessings. And matter of fact, my friend, listen to this. The Bible actually says every good thing that's in your life is there because of God, because He's a good God. And the Bible says it this way, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. So hopefully in that list of good things, you would acknowledge that those good things have come from God. All right, now let's go to the other side of the, of the ledger here, the bad things. What would be some of the things that you might include on the bad side? Maybe it would be the pains that you're experiencing right now in your life. Maybe the troubles or the trials, the tribulations. Maybe the disappointments, the failures, the fears that many of us have to deal with on a regular basis. Some of the bad things that we would definitely put on our list from a global perspective, right? We would, we would look at war and we would look at terrorism as bad things. Some of the bad things that we would include is North Korea acting like North Korea threatening to nuke everybody. What's up with that, right? That's bad. That's not good. We would definitely put on that list hunger. We would definitely put on that list the abuse of children in our world today. We would definitely put human trafficking on that list. And depending on where your life is at today, hopefully prayerfully, if you filled out a list like that, Hopefully, there's more good in your life than bad. Hopefully. But here's what we do know. We know that our life is really a mixture of both good and bad. That's the world that we live in. Let's say that you had the ability, that God gave you the grace and the ability to take all the bad that was on your list and just eradicate it, erase it like that. It's gone. And all that remained and all that was left in your life was good. What would you call your life then? Whole? A utopia? Heaven? And then let's say if all the good was taken away and all that was left on your list were all the bad things that were on your list, then what would, how would you describe your life? You would describe your life as broken. You would describe your life as purgatory maybe. You would describe your life as hell on earth. And here's what we know once again. Life is really a mixture of both, the good and the bad, the beauty and the brokenness. And the message of Easter and the message of Christ is that Christ came to fix the brokenness that's in our world. So when we look at our life today and we say, you know what, my life is a mixture of both beauty and brokenness, good and bad, ups and downs, right? What do we call that? The real world, <laughs> Look to your neighbor and say, he's talking about the real world, right? Come on, tell him, the real world. That's the world we live in. Yeah, it's broken, and it needs to be fixed. But think about a, a list of good and bad. Really, are we qualified to fill out such a list? Think about it. We're not experts when it comes to identifying what's good and what's bad in our life. Now, there are some things that's quite obvious that are bad. But sometimes we might put good things in our bad lists and bad things in our good list, and they should be reversed. And here's what we know about God, that He is good. And if we love Him, and if we turn to Him, and if we serve Him, here's what we know. He has the power and the ability to take all the stuff in our life, good and bad, beauty and brokenness, ups and downs, and somehow, some way, when we trust Him, He's able to use it for His glory and for our good. And that gives us hope. Now, you see, a dead Savior couldn't do that. A Jesus whose body is still buried somewhere in Israel couldn't do any of that. You see, if all Jesus is today is a corpse, and he's either a corpse or he's alive. He's either dead and buried somewhere in Israel, and one day they'll find his remains, or he's where he said he would be, and he's where his followers for centuries have said he is, seated at the right hand of the Father. It's either or. It can't be anything in between. You're either dead or alive. How many of you know that? Look to the person next to you and say, which one are you? Go ahead. <laughs> it is Easter Sunday. We're all alive. We'll see you next week. Dead or alive. Jesus is either dead or he's alive. If he's dead, that's a game changer. If he's alive, as Scripture teaches, and hundreds of millions of followers 2,000 years later have proclaimed, that, my friend, is a game changer. The Apostle Paul, he is uh, 
the most significant person in Christianity outside of Jesus himself, of course, and maybe outside of St. Augustine. The greatest theologian, the greatest contributor to the Christian faith is the Apostle Paul. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This guy was awesome. He was a religious zealot, a religious fanatic that hated Christianity, hated Jesus, and hated his followers. He did everything in his power to have them arrested and even had some Christians killed. He was a persecutor of the church. And then one day, he met not a dead Jesus. He met the living Lord and Savior Jesus on a road to Damascus. Jesus has a peculiar way of getting in your grill, a peculiar way of knocking you off your high horse, whatever your high horse might be. Because as Saul of Tarsus was riding this horse on the way to Damascus, you know, with letters in, in, in tote to uh, persecute more Christians, boom, he meets Jesus on the road. It changed everything. He became the greatest champion for the Christian faith. He began to preach Jesus everywhere and to everyone that he possibly could. He built churches and he wrote letters. One letter that he wrote was to the church at Corinth, the church that he helped to establish. And they had begun to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus and accept Jesus, even though they were pagans, ex-pagans, trying to still struggling with their paganism and had much paganism in the church. And it was a church in great need. It was a broken church, right, that needed fixing. And Jesus was helping those people like he does today in all of our lives. But they stopped believing. Somewhere along the line, they began to accept the twisted truth that somehow Jesus really did live, but he, didn't, he died, but he wasn't raised from the dead. So he wrote this letter, 1 Corinthians 15, he wrote this letter, and in the section that we're going to be looking at here in a moment, he directly addresses their misinformation that they had been believing and buying into, that Jesus wasn't alive. I want to read out of the message paraphrase translation by Eugene Peterson because it really brings to, to life this text that we're going to look at. 1 Peter 15, beginning in verse 12. Now let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, what Paul preached, what Peter preached, what John preached, what all the apostles preached, what all the disciples preached. Risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there is no such thing as a resurrection? Come on, Corinthians. How could you believe that? He's saying, let's take your beliefs to the logical conclusion of what those beliefs will lead to. Let's just say for a moment, you actually believe the resurrection didn't happen. All right, let's take what you believe to its logical conclusion. We need to do that in life from time to time. Listen to me. We need to do that from, from time to time. We need to take a time out in our life, and we need to look at how we're living our life and the decisions that we're making and the choices that we're making in our life, and we need to say, okay, when these play out, what's the, what will be the logical consequence, the logical end of the choices that I'm making today? And if you don't like what the outcome's going to be, then you, start, you need to start making better choices with your life. So here's what happens. Okay, if he didn't, wasn't raised from the dead, verse 13, if there is no resurrection, then there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. And everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. You know, all of life, all of this world, it's all smoke and mirrors outside of this one glaring reality. Jesus. Dead or alive. If you believe he's dead, it changes everything, and it should. If you believe he's alive, it changes everything, and it should. Paul says, I know he's alive. I know he's alive. I met him, and it's changed everything for me, and it can change everything for you. So, Corinthians, why are you beginning to not believe in the resurrection of Jesus? If you don't, it's all smoke and mirrors. What are you coming to church for? What are you praying for? What are you singing songs about Jesus for? What are you studying your Bible for? What are you reading your Bible for? Why are you doing any of that? It's all smoke and mirrors then, if he hasn't been raised from the dead. Verse 15, not only that, but we would be guilty, the apostles, Paul himself, would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. Every religion that does not promote the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to Paul, not me, 
don't get mad at me, according to Paul and the teaching of Scripture, is a bare-faced lie. You see, there cannot be many truths because one truth will always um, contradict another truth that claims or belief that claims to be true. So it can't be everybody has access or everybody has a way. There's only got to be one way. And Jesus happened to make that declaration himself while he was living. And that's why he made a lot of people mad while he was living. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, speaking of him himself. Paul goes on to say, not, not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you, verifying that God raised Jesus up, would be sheer fabrications. These affidavits, what's he talking about? He, he mentions earlier in this same chapter, there were 500, count them, 500 eyewitnesses, over 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Are you kidding me? That is an insurmountable mountain of evidence that points to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead because there were over 500 people that said, I saw with my own eyes the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Basically, Paul is saying, he's speaking uh, lawyer terms here, in lawyer terms, he's saying, I have signed affidavits of 500 eyewitnesses. Whoa. You see, here's what we know about Jesus. According to history, outside of Scripture, here's what we know. He did live. Nobody, nobody in their right state of mind. I know there are some people walking around who say they are Jesus Christ. We're not including them, okay? But there are, anybody in their right state of mind will not deny the fact that Jesus of Nazareth existed, born of peasant parents, Joseph and Mary. Nobody denies that he lived. Nobody denies that he taught what he taught. Nobody denies that he died. Where the controversy begins is what happened three days after he died. Paul said, we have signed affidavits of witnesses. This is, this is convincing evidence of who Jesus said he is and, and what happened. Verse 16, if corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't because he was indeed dead. He's saying, listen, you all know something. You all know. You all know because this happened a few years earlier. Jesus died. You see, as he hung on that cross from 9 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, six grueling hours, he became sin for the whole world. This sinless, sunless, sinless, spotless Son of God became sin for the whole world. He died. He breathed his last breath, and he said, it is finished. His disciples, before Sabbath began, before sunset, his disciples had to go, and they took his cold, limp, dead body from the cross. The Romans verified that he was indeed dead. They wrapped him in burial clothes and put him in a borrowed tomb and sealed the tomb with a stone. And the Romans, to ensure that his disciples would not come and steal him later, they put armed guards there to guard the dead corpse, the dead body of Jesus. And of course, the Roman world said, we're done with this rebel rouser. The religious leaders, the religious crowd of, of Jesus' day that rejected him as Messiah, they said, we're done with this. Satan himself, God and man's arch enemy said, can you believe it? We did it. I didn't know it would be so easy. We killed the Son of God. They were all like, this is great, Friday and Saturday, and then God messed up all their plans on Sunday morning, right? <laughs> Everything changed. Everything changed. You see, you have to ask yourself this question. Could a dead corpse a rotting body, change the world for good as Jesus, his life, his miracles, and his teaching has accomplished. Could a dead corpse do that? Absolutely not. Anybody in their right state of mind would not come to that conclusion. There is no way. The good, any good that's in this world, and I know there's been a lot of bad that was done in the, in the name of Jesus. Those people don't know him. They've never known him. But everything good that's in this world, it's here because of the life he lived, the things he taught, and the followers, the genuine followers who have tried to live out the teachings of Jesus. Why? They know he's alive, and they know his power is real. They've experienced it for themselves. 
Verse 17, and if Christ wasn't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark and lost as ever. Verse 18, it's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and resurrection because they're already in their grave. So your loved ones, your, your parents, your grandparents, God forbid if you've had to bury a child, all those that have died and you had the hope that they're in heaven one day you're going to see them, it's gone. It's gone. If you don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead, all of that is gone. It's even worse, he says, verse 18. Verse 19, if all we get out of Christ, if all we get out of this Christianity is a little inspiration for a few short years, we are a pretty sorry lot. He's like, if that's all we get in this life is a little bit of uplift and a little bit of encouragement, and that's all we get. We get no life after death. No heaven and beyond. This is all we get. We are the most sorry, pitiful, miserable group of people in all the world. You know what Paul's describing? Religious people who have religion but not a relationship with Jesus. The most joy-filled, peaceful, God-loving, hopeful people walking the face of the earth today are those who know that he is alive. It changes everything. You know, what, you know how Paul concludes this? In verse 32, he says this. He says this. Okay, if Christ is not risen from the dead, if he's not risen from the dead, then eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. You know what he's saying? He's saying if this, if this, if this truth it's not real at all. If Jesus simply came and he, he taught some wonderful things and get, let, lived a very good life and left a good example and he really isn't God and he wasn't raised from the dead, if that's not true, which he believed is true, he's simply addressing them based on their beliefs and the logical conclusion of their beliefs. He's saying if that's not true, eat, drink, be merry. In the modern vernacular, he's saying let's all get drunk and get laid. That's what he's saying. And that's how the world lives today. The Corinthians knew exactly what he was saying when he quoted that quote because that's how they were living their life before. They were all messed up, and some of them were still messed up. How many know you can be walking with Jesus and still be messed up? That's okay. He's patient. He's loving. He's kind. His mercies are new every morning, all right? You read the letter of Corinthians, you know what I'm talking about. He said, if, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, why are we even in church? Why do you pray? Why do you read your Bibles? Why do you try to keep the Ten Commandments? Let's just go out there and live like the devil because when we die, that's it. We're done. We're finished. That's all there is to it. Paul said, that's not the reality. Look at the uh, final verse, verse 20. Let's read this out loud together. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. Woo! Listen, if you're going to follow anyone, and if you're going to follow any faith, follow the one that has the most credibility. Follow the one that Jesus came, died, on the third day was raised from the dead. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He has the right to speak these two words into your life. Follow me. Speaking of himself, follow me. If you're going to follow anybody, anybody that you're following other than Jesus, you're following them to their grave because it's appointed unto men once to die. No matter how hard you try, you can only die once, but we're all going to die, right? And after that judgment, the Bible says, so anybody that's worth following, anybody that's, I know some of you follow Justin Bieber, okay, I, whatever. <laughs> Follow him on Twitter. Follow him on Facebook. Follow his, uh, okay, uh, whatever, right? Anybody worth following is Jesus because he and he alone conquered death, hell, and the grave. Come on, let's thank the Lord for that. Can't we do that? So here, here's, here's what this means for you and me today. 2,000 years later, it's still real today if you choose for it to be real in your life. It's either or. Either he's dead or he's alive. And for many people in our world today, they're on the dead side instead of on the live side. But if he's on the live side, it changes everything. 
It, it, it brings three powerful truths in our lives, three things that we can respond to concerning the Easter message. We can trust like we've never trusted before. We can follow like we've never followed him before. And we can obey him like we've never obeyed him before. Because we believe that he's alive. See, we can trust him. What can we trust about him? That he is the living Lord and Savior. Listen, the world's broken, we know that. In our own lives, we see evidence of that, don't we, if we're honest. So we need a Savior. And he's a Savior. He's not a glorified handyman. Sometimes we, I think we would prefer to have a glorified handyman Savior. You know what a handyman, oh, excuse me, I want to be gender neutral, a handy person? You know what a handy person is? A handy person is somebody when, you need, when you're in a jam and something's broken and you can't fix it, you call the handy person and they come, they fix it, you say thanks, you pay them, and then they leave. And you're like, see you later, hope I never have to call you back. That's the kind of Savior that a lot of people want. They, they want a 911 God. When I'm in trouble, you're there. When I'm not, I got things under control. Thank you very much. But that's not what Jesus is. He's not a, he's not a handyman Savior. This past week, my wife came to me. She said, I need to call a plumber. I said, why? She said, our shower head's leaking. I'm like, I got it. I'll take care of it. So she had to go uh, run some errands that day. So I said, I'm going to fix this before she gets home. So I got on YouTube. And I uh, said, how do you fix a leaky faucet? I Googled, and I, boom, there, the guy, there's a video. He's, he was awesome, right? He said, this is real simple. Here's the first thing you do. Shut off the main water valve. I'm glad he told me that. So I shut off the main water valve. So then I go in the shower, and, and then there are these two screws that hold the plate together. And take those out. I'm like, this is easy, two screws. So I took those two screws out. I'm like, wow. And I tried to take the plate off, and it wouldn't come off because the, the, the faucet handle was in the way. And I'm like, there's got to be one more screw. He didn't mention that. Other. Sure enough, there's one more. Three screws. Are you kidding me? This is easy. So easy a caveman could do it. So, you know, uh, I take that third screw off, and, and the handle comes off, and the whole plate comes off. I'm like, there it is. There's the picture in the video. There it is. Mine looks like his. And there's this valve thing or what thingamajig, whatever it is, you know, and, and, and it you know, gets corroded because the water buildup and all that, and that's what begins to cause the, the shower to leak. So he said, just pull that out, take it to Home Depot, and then show them your part, and then they'll give you the matching part. You can put it back in, you're done. I'm like, this is cool. So I, I, I try pulling out that little thingamajig, you know, that, that valve thing, whatever, and it wouldn't come out. His came out real easy. Mine's not coming out. I got a screwdriver. I'm trying to pry. I'm like, oh, this ain't good. I know what I'll do. I'll just take a picture of it. I'll take a picture of it, and I'll take it down to Home Depot. So I took a picture of it on my phone. I took it down to Home Depot, and I found a plumbing specialist in the plumbing aisle. And I said, I've got a leaky shower, and, and I need to fix it, and here's what it looks like. He goes, I can't even see it. I go, well, let me turn the brightness up. Okay, there you go. He's like, how old is your house? I said, 12 years. He goes, I don't have that part. I'm like, well, the guy on the video said you had the part. What's up with that? <laughs> I came, all down here for, came down here for nothing. And then there was a, another customer right next, and he says, Oh, you're replacing, you're replacing that valve, whatever, jig, thingamajig in your shower? I said, yeah. He goes, uh, are, you, are you attacking it from the front or the back? I said, excuse me? <laughs> he said, the front or the rear? I said, uh, I'm in the shower, so I guess it's the front, I hope. I said, you know, what do I know, right? <laughs> I'm just following the guy on YouTube. He said, oh, those things are a booger. I'll tell you what, if you don't do it right, and then the sales specialist says, you could break the main water line back there, and then you're really in a mess. I'm like, oh, this is beyond me. He said, you better get an expert. I said, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I was wanting my wife to come home, so I rushed home real quick, and I put it all back together. <laughs> and I was really wanting her to come home, and I wanted the whole thing to be fixed so she could say, you fixed it? I said, yeah, I fixed it. <laughs> I wanted to hear her say, you are the man. I said, I know, I'm the man. Let's celebrate. Say it again. I am the man. You know it. I'm your man. But I couldn't do that. So she comes home. It's like nothing happened. Right? I'm like, I think we better call the plumber for that. <laughs> you know why? Because there are some things you can't fix. And if you try to fix them, you're going to make them worse. You know, there are problems in your life you can't fix, and no man can fix, my friend. There are problems in our world that man can't fix. Our nation right now is broken. And if you think a man or a particular party or a group of individuals can fix it, you are sorely disillusioned, my friend. It's not going to happen. Things are so broken right now in our world and so broken. See, now we, we can call broken things whole. 
We can take broken things and we can legalize them and we can say broken things are okay. Broken things we're just going to learn to live with. But you know what? No matter what man says about that which is broken needs to be fixed, if it's broken, it's broken. And Band-Aids don't work. Band-Aid approaches and Band-Aid solutions aren't going to fix it. What we need is as a nation, we need to turn back to God and say, God, heal our brokenness. Don't condone our brokenness and help us and deliver us in Jesus' name. That's the power of the Easter message. You know, a couple weeks ago I heard that the president's limo broke down in Israel. And here's this, this most awesome limo, right? This thing has bulletproof glass. I mean, who in here wouldn't want to own this limo? It has bulletproof tires, right? It, it, uh, it has like rocket launchers apparently. This thing's awesome, and it's dead. It's stranded on the tarmac. You know why? Whoever is in charge of the limousines for the president need to be fired. They put unleaded gasoline in instead of diesel fuel. <laughs> now, even a guy like me who has the gift of breaking things is smarter than that. You don't put unleaded fuel in a vehicle that runs on diesel fuel. So it was stranded. This expensive, massive car stranded. By the way, I wonder if the same guy that, that is, is in charge of the gasoline, I wonder if he's the guy that named the limo. You know what they named it? They named it the Beast. All I need to know is find out the next limo is going to be called the False Prophet. I mean, we're going down a road that we don't need to go down. Yes, I wrote that joke. If you don't like it, you need to give more in the offering. That's all I can say, okay? <laughs> you know why that limo broke down? The Beast. You know why it broke down? Wrong Wrong, we put the wrong fuel inside, the wrong stuff. You know why we break down? You know why as a nation we're breaking down? You know why our world is breaking down? You know why marriages break down? You know why things break down? We're not using them the way they were created to be used. And you, my friend, were created by God and for God to trust Him, to follow Him, and to obey Him. You see, what if we got rid of our good and bad lists? Because we're not really good at a good and bad list. And what if we just had a whole new list and we called it a trust list? And we decided that everything and anything in our life, we're going to put on that trust list. No matter what happens, we're going to say, I trust you, God. I don't understand, but I trust you. I'm wondering why, but I trust you. I'm holding on because I trust you. And I trust you with this, that, and the other. And we have a trust list. And he's worthy to be trusted. Why? Because he did what nobody else could do for you, my friend, and for me. He demonstrated his love by dying and on the third day being raised from the dead. So now, you know what he says to us? The two most important words in the Bible. I know many of you are watching the Bible series. That's, that's good. It's a good thing to do. Watch the Bible series, okay? Uh, but let me, take, let me give you the whole Bible in two words. Here's the whole Bible. The two most important words in the whole Bible. The two most important words that God ever spoke. Here they are. Follow me. People would come to Jesus and all kinds of questions and, and concerns, and many times he wouldn't even answer them. He would just simply say, follow me. People would come with excuses, this, I can't, you know, I've got this, and my father just died, and, and then, I, you know, I've got this struggle over here. Follow me. Two words that really solve everything in our lives. Follow me. So he's asking you today, follow me. Let me ask you something. Are you following him? First of all, are you trusting him? Number two, are you following him? And then number three, are you obeying him? Are you looking at your life right now and the choices and the decisions that you're making and you're taking the things that you believe and the things that you're doing to its log logical conclusion to the ultimate outcome of what your life will be? And if you look at that, are you happy with what the end result's going to be? If not, it's time to change direction. It's time to stop putting the bad stuff in your life and it's time to start putting the right stuff into your life so that you can begin to go down the road that God has for you and begin to fulfill the plan that he has for your life. I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. In our overflow, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, things can change. You can have a new start. You can experience your personal resurrection. You can go from death to life, as the Bible describes it, from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, by surrendering your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've accepted Christ at some point in time in your life, but you've walked away from the Lord or things begin to happen in your life and you can't really pinpoint how and when, but you know you're far from God and you're not where you would like to be in your relationship with Him. That described all of us at some point in time. 
that can change if you'll simply be sensitive to God calling you to serve him today. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's you, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray with you. This is the most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life, to surrender your life to Christ. If that's you, heads bowed, eyes closed, believers quietly praying, I want to know who I'm about to pray with and pray for. I want you to do two things. I want you to raise your hand, and I want you to look my way, because I want to make eye contact with you right now. Everyone, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. I see your, yes, I see those hands. God bless you. Hands are going up literally everywhere. God bless you, my friend. Yes, I see your hands and your hands. Thank you. God bless you. Hands are up, going up everywhere. Thank you, Lord. Up in the balcony. Thank you. I see all your hands. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The Lord, by his Holy Spirit, is drawing you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down in the tent, in the overflow area. You can raise your hand. We have pastors there. We're acknowledging what the Lord's doing in your life right now. This is really big. You see, heaven is about to be filled with new souls that are going to be there because of a prayer that's about to be prayed. So this is so important. Here's what I want everybody to do. I want everybody to quietly stand to your feet. Quietly stand to your feet. Those of you that raise your hand, even if you didn't raise your hand, but you want to be included in this, I'm going to ask you to do something really, really bold. You see, Jesus did something for you really, really bold. He hung on a cross for the whole world to see. Now the Lord says, follow me and do it publicly. Because if, if you'll confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father and all of his holy angels in heaven. There's something about making a public demonstration of what God's about to do in your life. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Something bold and courageous. I'm going to ask you if you raise your hand, even if you didn't. I want to meet you. I want to pray for you. And I want to do it right down here at this altar. Jesus said these words. He said, all that come unto me I will not push away. I will not cast away. There has never been a sinner that's come to Jesus with a broken, repentful heart that he has said, nope, heaven's full, can't take any more. Nope, you're not the right size. You're not the right color. You're not the right this. You're not the right that. There's no one that he sent away. All that come unto him. He gives freely, the Bible says, to drink of the water of life. And he said, if you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. A religious man came to Jesus one time by the name of Nicodemus. And I know there are more that still need to be up here. In this auditorium, in our overflow, in our upstairs. So even now, begin to make your way to the front. We're going to pray in just a moment, together, all at once. A religious man came to Jesus one day and he said, How do I get to heaven? How do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, You must be born again. And so the man, being an intellectual and a religious man, he said, He heard the word born again. He's like, do I enter a second time in my mother's womb? And like, Jesus like, don't go there, dude, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. He said, I'm talking about a spiritual rebirth. What's about to take place in your life is something indescribable. You're going to become a brand new person on the inside. Listen, religion, religion and Christianity are not the same. Christianity is a relationship. It's not a religion. We can make it into a religion, but it's a relationship. And here's what religion does. Religion tries to change us from the outside in. Don't do this, don't do that, go here, don't go there, wear this, don't wear this. It tries to change us from the outside in. Here's what Christianity is about. Jesus changing us from the inside out. Hallelujah. And here's what the Bible says. Revelation 3.20, the last book of the Bible, it says this. Jesus is talking. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man hear my voice and open up the door of their heart, I will come into them and I will have fellowship with them and they will have fellowship with me. Jesus, in this service today, was knocking on the door of your heart. And guess what you've just done? You have opened the door. You've answered the call. And now Christ is going to come into your life. What we're about to do is also in the Bible. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says this. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, here's the promise of Scripture, you will be saved, period. Listen, you don't have to go to church to be saved. You don't have to be water baptized to be saved. You don't have to read your Bible to be saved. All those things are good. All those things are commands in Scripture. Only one way to get saved, surrender your life to Jesus. And we're going to lead you in that prayer collectively as a church. Because everybody that's not up here, at some point in time in our life, we've, we've done what you're doing right now. So let's pray this 
together to God. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I turn from sin. I turn from every bad thing that I've been doing, that I've been thinking, that I have done in my entire life. And I turn to you, God, and I ask you today, forgive me. And by your love and by your grace and the shed blood of Jesus, I receive forgiveness of my sins. And I receive a new heart, a new life, and a new start. You are now my heavenly Father, and I am your child from this day forward forevermore. Amen and amen and amen. Woo! Praise God. My friend. I am not making any of this up. We're going to give you a free Bible. You're going to begin to read the Bible. You're going to find out everything that this guy was saying is in the Bible. Right now, Jesus said, when one, just one sinner, turns to God in repentance, here's what Jesus said. All the angels in heaven start rejoicing. Did you know there's a party going on in heaven right now? That's biblical. That's true. Okay, now listen. What I'm about to say is not biblical. It's just a theory. If all the angels in heaven are rejoicing right now, some of you have grandparents, parents, loved ones that are in heaven. And they're probably saying, oh, we know what's happening. Somebody down there is getting saved. And the angel's saying, yes. And it just could be that maybe that angel, because this part's true now. I'm not making this part. Everybody has an angel assigned to them. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? Maybe that angel is assigned to you knows you and says, yeah, it was so-and-so. And they're like, no way! That's my granddaughter, or that's my husband that I left behind. That's my wife, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my friend. They're going to be in heaven now? Yeah! And now everybody's rejoicing. Come on! Woo! That's why the angels are celebrating. This is real. You're going to leave today and the devil's going to say, what in the world did you just do? That's not real. It's not going to last. Let me tell you something. He's a liar. Okay, he's a liar. Now listen, does it mean your life's going to be perfect from this day forward? No. Does it mean that you're not going to have any more struggles? No, that's not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to soft sell you on this, okay? Because this is not a sell anyway. This is a way of life. Here's the deal. Whatever you are struggling with, whatever you will have to face in the days and weeks to come, here's the promise. You will never have to face it alone because you have a friend that will stick closer than a brother, a living Lord and Savior who's now permanently a part of your life. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, here's what we guarantee. Here's what we guarantee at Trinity, okay? If you will begin to attend church regularly, if not this church, hopefully this church, if not this church, another church that teaches and preaches Jesus, here's what we guarantee. If you'll begin to attend church regularly, you'll begin to read your Bible. We're going to give you a Bible. You begin to attend a life group or what we, what we, a Bible study or what we call a life group. You'll begin to do these simple things in your life. Begin to fellowship with other Christians. Six months from today, I promise you, six months from today, you'll look back on your life and you will be utterly amazed at the changes that Jesus has made in your life from the inside out. Amen? Praise God.